Okay, we are going to continue with the next uh, list of uh, styles or, or architectural patterns, which are for distributed and big data systems. So the next, I mean, we, we are going to talk in, in this is the 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 contents of this lesson. We are going to talk about integration styles, some topologies, uh, the broker patterns, the peer-to-peer, -peer, service-oriented architecture, microservices, and serverless. And so this is for distributed systems, and later we are going to talk about big data uh, and scalable systems. Uh, about integration systems, uh, just an overview, there are different integration systems. This is because, I mean, before talking about distributed systems, I think it was interesting to know how to integrate different systems. So the, the main idea here is that you have uh, different systems and you want to, in, to, to and they are running in parallel, they are distributed and you want to integrate them. The the first one, file transfer, is the, the old way to communicate some systems is that you have one application that generates one file and another application that imports this file and does something with that file. So this is the old uh, version. Uh, the advantages is that you have uh, those applications can be run uh, independently from each other. You have very low coupling and this is very easy to debug. But the, the, this, uh, the challenges is that you have to agree in a common file format. Uh, also, the coupling, if you agree in this file format, is can be increased and you also have to coordinate. Um, sometimes the problem is that you generate one file uh, one in, at what point in time. Later, you generate an, another file and at the end you have two files and you can increase and you have more than one file so at the end it could be also a problem of coordination uh, between those different applications and also you need some manual adjustments so this is not a nice way but this is a very old way to integrate different systems another old way to integrate different systems is that you share a database you have a, a shared database and all the applications uh, store the information in that database and this is a way to integrate those systems the advantages is that this is very familiar and the data is always available but you also have a single point of failure you need to uh, to know what is the scheme of the database, you have uh, the database can have a, can be a bottleneck, and you have a problem of synchronization, scalability, and so on. Okay, uh, there are some variants here, and one definition that I want you to know is what is called the ETL. ETL is a process called extraction, transformation, and loading, and this is when you have a, a database. And what you do is you extract data from the database, you transform that data, and you load that data in another database, for example. So this is uh, you extract, you transform, and then you load in another database or in a shared database. So this is a the ETL uh, is an acronym that you will find in a lot of times in, in software. So this is uh, interesting that you know. And data warehousing is a database that you are using. For example, if you do ETL, and um, you could have this uh, database for uh, data analysis, and this is uh, a reporting. This is something that maybe is useful in some applications that you have. A, a a big system and then you do ETL processes and then you have a data analysis data uh, yeah, a data analysis system uh, this is called data warehousing okay another uh, style I mean, I mean this style I'm not sure if you are even the other course in so in distributed systems you already have these slides because sometimes some people already told me that you know about this uh, this is, as I said, this is an overview. It's remote processor call is is call is when you have an application that is invoking a function or a procedure from another application. So you have this uh, structure. Usually, you have the staff and the skeleton is the where you have these APIs from the application that is invoking the other application. And the advantages here is that uh, you could hide the implementation in this API, so it's a way to, to hide information, and this is very familiar to developers. 
what are the challenges here? And this is uh, one of the things that uh, I'm going to talk a bit more later, is that you have these eight fallacies of distributed computing, which is that the network is not reliable, uh, the latency is never zero, the bandwidth is fin finite, the network is not secure, and so on. So uh, these are fallacies, and they and probably you already know about this. And this is these are something that you have to take into account when you are doing remote procedure call, because sometimes people think that uh, they these fallacies. I mean, they think that this is not true, and they they think they think that if they invoke a procedure is is in another application, everything is going to run as easy as if it was in the same machine as uh, as, he, as we have. For example, in your lab assignment this year, when you are using the solid to ask for the contacts of the of, of a friend for the friends of a of a person uh, you are doing a remote procedure call in some way uh, using the solid system so you have to take into account sometimes the, the problem of the network and this kind of things okay um, Again, there are new proposals here, for example, GRPSC. This is a, a new proposal which is now quite popular because this has been proposed by Google. Uh, and this is a, a remote procedure call framework uh, which, with high performance. And this is an interesting thing that maybe you, you at least you, you should know that, so that some people are proposing this kind of things. The other, the, the fourth uh, pattern for for integration of systems is when you have multiple uh, in independent applications that are communicating between each other, sending messages to a channel. So this is again based on the event-driven architecture. So you have events that are being generated here. You have, uh, and this is similar to publish. So this one is publishing a message, and these ones are subscribed to these messages. So this is publish as a subscribe, and these are. Uh, this has the asynchronous communication, low coupling, asynchronous communication, and encapsulation of the implementation. So those are the advantages. The challenges are the same. This is very similar to the event-driven architecture that I was talking in the in the other lesson. Um, here, what I want to say here is that there are two main topologies of messaging. So this is uh, here you can see the uh, one challenge here is what is the topology of this event uh, or this messaging uh, architectures and the two topologies are hub and spoke and the bus. Hub and spoke it is related with the broker pattern that we are going to see later and it is when you have uh, centralized message broker so you have uh here this is a broker and this is the the one that is uh, taking care of the communication between the different applications so they have an adapter to the centralized broker and then this one is in charge of the different uh, or sending the different messages to the different applications the the alternative to have and spoke is uh, a bus. So here you have a message bus, and the different applications must have a bit more uh, information here because they need to have the adapter and the integration engine to the message bus. So this is a a, a bit, you know, sorry, I could say a, a more complex, but it's different because now you have every application has to communicate with the bus, but every application needs to have not only the adapter but also the integration engine. Okay, um, so here there are a lot of systems uh, that are based on this uh, structure, and this is something called MOM, which comes from message-oriented middlewares, which is uh, that you have the messages are. So I mean, th these are the all the middleware that handles or the the communication with the messages. Okay, so you have. Uh, I mean, the, and also you have this definition, which is the enterprise service bus that was very trendy. There were a lot of uh, commercial applications that were uh, that have been sold that uh, had this enterprise service bus, where everything was connected with the with the enterprise service bus. Related with this topology, as I said, is the broker pattern. The broker pattern is that you have a client. Uh, which is communicating with a server and they have they 
do this uh, request using uh, the stuff is the API. I mean, is the 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 software that the client is using to connect to the broker and the skeleton is the, the software that is being used by the server. And also related with this is the bridge. The bridge is that there can be some communication between brokers. OK, so those are the, the different elements of this architectural style. You have the broker as the one that is uh, managing the communication. The client sends requests. You have the proxy in the part of the client is the staff. The proxy in the part of the server is the skeleton. And the, the bridge is the one that connects the different brokers. Advantages and disadvantages of broker is that you can have this separation of concerns that you, you are delegating the low level communication aspects to the broker. Uh, you separate the maintenance and this in principle this is more reusable. The servers are independent from the clients and you have this portability because at the end what you have to port is the broker. So you have different parts of the broker and you have interoperability which some bridges. Uh, there is some performance uh, because at the end you are adding an indirection level. You can increase coupling between the different components and the broker is a single point of failure. Application of this is this is something which is a very old uh, style that was very, very trendy. I think in the 1990s and was Corva. Um, with this, I mean, in, with this style, I only wanted you to, to know that there was an architectural style called a broker. OK, but nowadays it's not uh, so much famous and so much popular, but at least in the 90s it was very trendy. And some, nowadays there are some systems that under the hood they are based on, on Corva. Uh, the other style for distributed systems, and this is uh, again, this is a style that I find quite interesting um, in some some environments, some domains, uh, is something that maybe you, you should consider is what is called peer to peer. I mean, peer to peer is uh, was very, very trendy. Um, the idea is that you have different computers that are in principle, they are equal uh, or they have the, the same uh, rights and they are connected using a network. And each of them is independent from each other, but they can collaborate to do some task. OK, so uh, probably you already know what is peer to peer, so it's not necessary to, to repeat that. So the elements are the, the different computational nodes, the network protocol, and the idea is that you, there is no main node. This is important. In principle, all peers, but I have there are two variants here. One is where you have all peers that are equal and some, another variant, which is usually the, the one that is most of the time used, is where you have some peers which are called super peers which uh, have more rights that the, than the others uh, advantages and disadvantages of peer-to-peer -peer, you have the decentralized information and control there is no central authority here uh, it is fault tolerance because there is no single point of failure um, if one of the peers fails that it, it is not compromising the the rest of the whole system okay the challenges here is how to keep the state of the system the complexity of of the protocol is is, is a bit difficult there are limitations in the bandwidth, I mean, the, sometimes the, you have to take into account the the latency and the and the and the network latency and the protocol latency because it's, if you want to to be have full peer to peer, it's, it's something you have to take into account. And also sometimes you could have malicious peers, so you could have some problems of security. Uh, of course, a lot, a lot of. Uh, applications. Um, I mean, for example, I added here blockchain because this is uh, nowadays is very, uh, very popular. But you have also sensor networks, collaborative systems, e-commerce, uh, some very old things like Napster, BitTorrent, uh, and so on. And there is this variant that I said that is uh, super peers that have more rights than the other peers. Okay. Now let's go to to the next style, which is service oriented architectures. And again, this is a style which is a bit old, but I think it deserves a, a, a section. Uh, it deserves that I say something to you about service oriented architectures. Um, 
well, the, the acronym usually is called uh, SOA, SOA. Um, the idea is you have different services that are connected to the internet. They have an interface and an independent implementation and they communicate with each other. So this is the main idea. The elements are the, the service that is providing the provider of the service, the consumer, this is the client that is asking some part or some provider, the messages that are being exchanged. There is a contract. So if you go here, there is a contract between one service that is invoking an interface. So this is there is a contract, which is the well, it's, nowadays is usually called the API. And there is the location of the service is the the endpoint. So here you have uh, when you are asking this service, you need the location. Usually, if they are web services, they are the this is a URL. So you have the URL of the web service, and that's the location. And then there is some agreements, some service level agreements. Uh, so and this is usually called the policy. The policy of the servers of the services that well, these kind of things that you, uh, for example, for performance, for for security, and so on. The constraints of this architecture is that, uh, I mean, this is a, a nice diagram that I, I borrowed here, that you have the service consumer, usually uh, it bins to an endpoint that is being exposed by the service. It also has to adhere to some policy that is governed by this uh, service. For example, the policy is that you have to to connect in some kind of way, the, it understands the contracts that is being served by this service, which is implementing this contract. This contract is usually the API, the description of the, 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 the API. And also this contract is usually described, is, is usually describing the messages which are being exchanged between one service and the other. Okay, so it's the, this service sends a message to this other service, uh, and also receives answers from the other service. So these are the main constraints. And this is a nice picture, I think, about those constraints. What are the advantages and disadvantages of uh, service-oriented architectures? The main advantage is that you have, you can have in the Dependence from language and platform. I mean, this was very popular when there was, a, I mean, there was uh, these two technologies, uh, Java and .NET. Um, they were very similar um, from from different vendors. Um, some people could choice could choose to use Java, or other people could choose .NET. And sometimes it was difficult to to choose because to, to do the choice because it's they were very similar. Um, someone decided, okay, but if they expose a web service, then those web services can be implemented. One of them in Java and the other one in .NET, and they can communicate and they can exchange messages. So you have this independence from the language, and this is important. So this is one uh, in that point in time. This was considered quite important. Also, the interoperability uh, using the standards and to have low coupling between those services implemented in different ways and to be decentralized, uh, to be reusable, to have this scalability where you can have uh, a call from one from one to many, so you are also one to one. So this is important. I mean, you if you expose a service, then you have you can have so this is one service to many clients so this is the one possibility or one to one so this was difficult but and also it was like a partial solution for legacy systems the legacy systems are very very important because they i mean legacy system is a system that has been developed some time ago. Imagine a system that was developed, for example, in COBOL, and you have an, an old system, and you have new applications, and you want to communicate with the old system. But imagine that this is it has been developed in COBOL, and you are having a new program, which is, for example, in Java. And nobody wants to touch this uh, piece of code in COBOL because it was very old, and maybe the developers have been retired. So what some one solution was to create a wrapper of this code in Java. 
So you have this wrapper and you uh, create this wrapper uh, as a web service and then from new code in Java or .NET or whatever, you can invoke this uh, web service uh, that the internal implementation is kept uh, in COBOL. So this is how you can uh, have a solution to legacy systems because you are adding a web service layer. Okay. The challenges here, I mean, the performance sometimes is not good because you are dividing the application using the web because at the end they are usually web services. Uh, if, if you have a real time system, maybe it's it's not necessary to divide and to, to put everything in, in on the web. So, so sometimes this is even overkill to some environment which is very homogeneous. We imagine a, a, a controller for a, an airplane. So maybe you don't need to have a web services architecture for that. Uh, the security, so you have this risk of exhibiting uh, the API to external parties, so you could even have denial of service attacks, and you can also have this problem of coordination and composition of services. So this is also some challenge of web services. And here there are two main variants of service-oriented architectures. This is a historical uh, thing that happened, but I think it's interesting that at least you, that you know how it evolved. The first one we are going to talk about WS uh, star and then about REST. WS star, uh, it was a model proposed by the W3C, I mean, it's uh, the, the World Wide Web Consortium. Um, the idea is that it was like a set of specifications uh, here. I mean, not only for the WCC, but also about other internationalization standards, committees. And the idea is that they wanted to have like a reference implementation for service oriented architecture. Uh, the three main uh, technologies that were very popular were SOAP, uh, WSDL, and UDDI. Nowadays, they are not so much used, but maybe you go to some a project or some company and you will find that they are just still using SOAP or, or WSDLs. That's why I, I still explain that. Um, one of the problems is that maybe that they had a lot of uh, 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 definitions, a lot of specifications, so it was not a uh, easy architecture. Okay, so they have this kind of uh, architecture where you have the uh, underneath you have so is the the format of the messages you have these extensions of so for reliability transactions then you have the descriptions of the services within WSDL you could also put those descriptions in UDDI and so on so let's uh, yeah, yeah, okay so, and this uh, so th this was more or less the architecture. Of course, most of these things were based on XML and uh, DTDs and XML schema. So as I said, it was very trendy. Maybe in 2000, I think it's in 2005, between 2005 and 2010, it, this was very, very trendy. Uh, it was a bit overkill and especially where this I mean probably this slide you are not I mean, it's very difficult that you can see anything uh, here I can see some acronyms for example WS security uh, WS trust uh, and so on but this is intended I mean I, I put this slide because this was like a map of all the web services standards in at that point in time and as you can see there were a lot of specifications so maybe there were too many specifications also for this uh, architecture uh, and probably this is why it is called WS star uh, one of the I have to say that for me, it was like a bit uh, ambitious. Um, most of these specifications probably they were not mature enough, and that's why at the end this uh, WS star uh, nowadays is not very popular. It's not very trendy. Okay, uh, 
the three main specifications were uh, in WS Star was, and the, the main idea is that you have the web service implementation. It usually uh, records or publishes the description of the web service in the UDDI. The, this was the registry. It, it was like the yellow pages in, of web services, and then you have the client. The client search for the UDDI in this registry. This is like a registry of web services. And once it finds one that he likes, uh, they exchange information in SOAP. OK, so this is the idea of this slide. I have to say that this slide, uh, I created this slide in 2001. OK, so this is 10, 20 years ago. This was a summer course that I was giving here at the University of Oviedo. And I created this slide here, and this is the idea of of this is interesting because the idea of service oriented architecture is in fact is interesting. But most of these technologies nowadays they are not uh, popular and they are replaced by by JSON or REST or something like that. And something that nowadays is not used is this uh, idea of a yellow pages or a registry a registry of uh, web services okay continue with this slide from 2001 from 20 years ago <laughs> uh, there was one idea that was uh, interesting was like a ecosystem of web services where you have uh, an application the user application that was uh, doing request in xml uh, and then you have different systems for billing for for to convert the currency for manage the users and so on. So this is the idea of a web service ecosystem. Nowadays, it is more or less the same idea when you have uh, microservices, microservices and, and you have uh, this, uh, these ideas are very, very similar. So this is why I want to say that this was even something that was uh, already said in 2001. Uh, Looking back to those specifications, SOAP, the idea is that you have uh, the specification of the messages. So this is the way that you are defining the messages. Uh, well, this was the evolution at that point in time. It had a good industrial industrial adoption, as I said, in 2007, almost 13 years ago. Uh, this is the main metaphor that they have. You have like an envelope, you're sending a message to someone. And this was an example in 2001 about how to invoke a web service and notice here this was a web service to add two numbers where is the here so i was going to add to to some uh, three and two so this was three and two and the answer was going to be five and this was a web service but notice that this web service was uh, invoked using a post. So one of the problems of the WS star specification was that they were using post for things that probably were not necessary and this could be solved usually uh, using a uh, get. Uh, okay, so this is one of the problems that I will talk later. Advantages and disadvantages of WS star the advantages were there were a lot of specifications, the community uh, it had an industrial adoption. There was like an integral view of web services and had a lot of extensions, but not all the specifications were mature. It was a bit of over specified and there was a lack of real implementations at that moment. So and also there was this abuse of RPS, RPC, remote procedure call uh, style. So sometimes so the, the, the alternative was going to be developed uh, using REST that was uh, not using this remote procedure call style. OK, so uh, of course applications, a lot of applications. But now let's go to, to REST and probably I will try to finish in, in this 10 minutes about REST. Uh, REST comes from a representational state transfer and the idea of REST comes from Roy, Roy Fielding in his PhD dissertation. This is a 20 years ago, uh, 21 years ago uh, PhD. But if you are interested in this thing, I recommend you to read this PhD because this is a PhD about software architecture. And this guy was trying to define what was the software architecture of the web. 
Uh, so this is a really a, an interesting uh, reading about, I mean, a historical reading about the architecture of the web. Uh, the idea of REST is that you have applications that also have the, these web services. So this is, is a variant of service oriented architectures, but the interface is almost always the same. It's a very uniform interface. So most of the web applications have a uniform interface where the the actions that you can do are most of the time are the same. So you have you can do a get, a put, a post, and then a delete using you have a URI to identify the endpoint. And, and this is the main idea of REST that you have this uniform interface to communicate. Uh, you have the constraints is that the resources have a uniform interface. They are identified by URIs and you have these uh, possibilities. OK, uh, REST is an architectural style and I have to say that you have different levels of adoption. You have the uh, hybrid REST, which is a, a variant of remote procedure call, and you also have a RESTful, which is uh, usually based on resources. Of course, REST is important to identify the, def the different resources, and you don't keep the state. Uh, in fact, REST can be seen as a composed style of layers, client server, uniform interface, uh, uh, and uh, code on demand. So this is interesting that you can see that, I think this is, uh, I have later, yes, this is style, so this is light, is where I can see that REST is based on all these uh, styles. So you can see that how uh, one software architectural style can be a composition of other architectural styles. Uh, some definitions about uh, REST, these methods has uh, have this uh, definition where uh, they can be uh, safe or independent in the in independent so and independent independent i'm not sure if this is uh, right okay I have to look at this because probably this is a mistake here so but the idea is that you have uh, i mean what the, the main idea here is that if you put, you are creating a resource, it is not safe because you are changing the server, but if you repeat several puts, and which is meaning that you are trying to create the same resource more than one time, it is in the, in the, pond, in the pond. I, I know so here, about here, but this is because uh, the result is the same as if you are only doing it once, okay? But if you are updating, imagine that you are increasing the birth, I mean, the, the uh, a number, uh, if you increase a number, if you repeat that several times, you are increasing a number, you are increasing several times that number. So this is why it is not in the independent. I have to, to look what is the right uh, spelling of this, uh, but this is not safe and not uh, independent, independent, sorry, uh, retrieve is uh, both yeah, is safe and the other one and the lead is not safe, but it is also uh, this part because independent, but it seems it is. Okay, so the effect of executing is n times is the same as executing it once. Okay, so this is an important feature of these actions and you have to take into account that uh, because if you are doing post, uh, the post actions cannot be uh, catched. I mean, you cannot put those actions in a cache and and you have always to go to the original server and you cannot optimize the, the web, okay? There is another definition related with this, which I like is the this hypermedia as the engine of application state. And it is where you return in the representations, you return URIs, to the available options in the your architecture, so you can continue uh, doing more actions on those uh, act, uh, on those options. Okay, so for example, if you go, you obtain a list of students, and from the list of students, you obtain also the URI for those students, so you can go to those specific students. Okay, so this is also an, a feature that I think is in, interesting to to handle the state also by the client. Okay, because in principle this is stateless. Okay, you don't. The server doesn't store information between from the the server from the clients. 
the main advantages and challenges here, I mean, this is at the end, it is the advantages of client server is where you have separation of concerns. You also have low coupling. Uh, you have this uniform interface, which allows independent development, scalability. You can improve the answer times because you also can also have uh, caches and, and also have less network load and less bandwidth. Which, and this is a lot of advantages of using REST. Uh, I have to say that it is a lot of times REST is not exactly, so you have this variant which is a remote procedure call variant of a REST and sometimes that's not very elegant and also some requirements about security, transactions are not easy to handle in REST. Okay, so that's something that's a, a problem. Um, so this is a, or a service based architecture is um, so this is a, another variant which is called service based architecture is when you have uh, you export different services with a user interface, usually an API and you have here the database. This is a, a variant uh, where you have a single database and you have different services. So this is the main idea and the constraints is that each service can be independently deployed. Uh, the services are usually quite coarse grained and the the user interface can be divided in different topologies and there is a database which is shared by each service. Okay, and in this way this have this modularity and uh, I mean you have disadvantages that you have uh, each service can be implemented in different languages and it's easy to do. You have several frameworks available, reliability and also some modularity of the development. But of course, you have the problem of scalability if you have a database, a single database, and how to evolve those services. And also the problems that usually this is the the Kongui law is breaking this part because you have the database, the user interface, the programmers, and and so on. And with this, I'm going to finish this for today. I'm going to close.